So, Chavra, welcome once again. Taking a look at some Inyanim. After missing a day, we're going to do a double whammy. Get uh, through Yisod, Shbi Yisod, and Malchus as well. Come to a completion of the Mida of Yisod in its entirety, at least for this year. Looking at it from the perspective that we've had, which is ultimately, in, in a broad sense, the path towards freedom, towards self-actualization, understanding how the Torah itself contains within it the um, the guidelines by which we can become who we're meant to become, step into the role of a ben chorin, of ein lecha ben chor, and elimisha osik b'Torah, create ourselves anew, in the language of the Medrash Tamchuma, become ourselves the one who gave the Torah at Sinai, so that we can step into both the role of the Nosein as well as the Mikabel, and actualize our relationship with Hashem coming up to Shavuos. So we're looking at the Mida of Yesod tonight, specifically Yesod Shabi Yesod. Foundation within foundation. So until now we've been talking about the role of a Tzadik as being the Tzadik Yesod Olam, as being the one who expresses the hopes and dreams of Maise Bereshis, who embodies within himself the wish of a Kadosh Baruch Hu for there to be or in the world. The Yehi Or was that Hashem was Gonzo the Tzadikim Lasad Lavo, and a person who commits themselves to the Tzadik Be'amunaso Yichia, who has the Ne'amunus to that orig- initial vision and commits his life to being an authentic, integrous, wholesome expression of that Or in the world. Is the embodies the Mida of Yisod, which is tzaddik. But one aspect that that we still haven't really addressed in our explorations of Yisod is the predicate upon which the the tzaddik himself bases his conduct, bases himself as being that channel. And that is, what is it that makes a person, makes a tzaddik, someone who's roi, to be that um, that sinor, that channel for or in the world. What is it? What are the qualities that 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 very channel of or itself are based upon? In other words, what is the foundation of the whole the whole notion of a human being encapsulating Hashem's or in the world? If we could to put it like that. So I want to take another spin at a pasuk that we looked at at the beginning of our explorations of Yisod. Which is the pasuk in Mishlei of Yodea Tzadik Nefesh Behemto? That the Tzadik knows the pashup shot of this pasuk was the Tzadik knows the well-being or the, the you know the health condition of his animals, of the things that are his belongings, and we learned how what that meant was that a Tzadik is sensitive to the needs of creation around him, of life, and does whatever he can to cultivate life, and that's all true. But there's another implication of the Pasuk, which is spoken about by a number of the commentaries, particularly amongst those from the Hasidic influence, although the truth is, I think, the roots can be found in the Rabbeinu Bachia and the Karakemach. And that is, is that the Nefesh Behemto is talking about one's own self, the physical condition of being a human being. Right, which is the feeling that we all kind of wanted the Pasuk to be talking about. Turns out the Pasuk could actually be talking about that. And the way the Rabbeinu Bachya says, he says that Yadua ki Maila Satsadik ala Rasha, the elevated level that makes it Sadik a step above a Rasha, Enu Elabachnat ha Nefesh Abahamit, is only by means of the subjugation of his physical Nefesh, of his animalistic soul, of his Gabrus and Nefesh of Sichlis, and by means of elevating the, the conscious soul, the spiritual qualities of his being above the animalistic. And he says that the whole notion of the Torah and its foundation is that a person breaks his physical lusts and desires and subjugates them all into purity and bringing them into service of the, of the, of the mind, of consciousness. And it says that a person who does this and he strengthens his mind over his desires, that's what's called a tzaddik, says the Rebbein Vachir. Hu anikra tzaddik. Val amar shlomo yodea tzaddik nefesh behemto. That a person, this is what Shlomo was talking about when he said, a tzaddik knows his animalistic spirit. And it's talking about being machnia, he says, that the idea of da'at is to, is to subjugate, 
is that the Pasuk is saying, Yigret Tzadik kol mishemachnia nefesh behemdo. Anyone who subjugates, who, who provides hachna'a, you know, maybe subjugate might not be the best word. We can debate if that's the proper translation of hachna'a. You know, hachna'a is sometimes used, you know, uh, synonymously with humility. So it has that sense of putting it in its right place, of understanding the place of his animalistic quality, of his physical condition, and utilizes the animalistic aspects of himself, his physical desires, in service of a Kodesh Baruch Hu. A little bit more pronounced of, a, of an explanation is put forward by the Baal Shem Tov. We don't have actually many original writings from the Baal Shem, but many of his students and others farm quoted things over from him. So this is brought down in the Sefer that they published of the, of the writings of the Baal Shem. And he says, he explains this Pasuk, that he says, That even one's animalistic desires and his, his animalistic spirit is connected into one's avoda. Because yodea is a lashon of da'at, is a lashon of chibur, of connection. And so the tzaddik, and we've seen this theme already before, that the tzaddik is able to be mechaber all the different aspects of his life, even the lowly qualities of, of his existence, into the avod of Hashem. But I think that the, that the idea that both the Rebbeinu Bachia on one side, and uh, in a very different world, but in a similar theme, the Baal Shem is talking about over here, is the idea of what is the role of a tzaddik predicated upon? How is it that a tzaddik becomes the type of person who can successfully be Megala that or in this world. Because it's not necessarily a given. And so I think that, that the, one of the things that they're pointing at is that it comes from a, a heartfelt participation of all the different aspects of who you are as who you are. And not, so to speak, splitting away from the, the, the defaults of being a human being on this planet, but Adraba bringing them into service and actually creating the foundation upon which a person becomes a tzaddik. In other words, it's not so much that a tzaddik separates away and that's what makes him a tzaddik as opposed to a rasha. It's not that he finds himself on a different plane of reality than a person who is mushka in Gashmias. It's on the contrary. He utilizes Gashmias as the basis of his elevation towards Tzidkus. As we saw in a similar vein, where we read through the letter from Rav Hutner, that he spoke so beautifully about how the Tzaddik is specifically a state which is arrived at by means of conquest with the elements of Ra and the base elements within oneself. Here we're finding that it's, that it's actually those raw components which create the platform upon which a Tzaddik can build his life as a Tzaddik. And in fact, it's only in as much that he has that connection with the, with the physicality that he becomes a tzaddik. And I think that there's a couple of areas throughout Chazal where this idea comes to light. One of the most beautiful places where we find this is the Gemara in Sanhedrin and perhaps even more poignantly in the Gemara in Chagiga and Tesvavah and Beis. But we have this amazing story where in Chagiga, where Shmuel, the, you know, the first generation of Mora, came across Rav Yehuda, that he was hanging his head in misery in the doorway one day. He walks by and he sees Rabbi Yehuda just banging his head against the wall, right, so to speak, to use our more contemporary uh, metaphor for the language. And he was crying and he was standing there and mom was dejected. And he said to Rabbi Yehuda, he said, sharp one, my brilliant Talmud Chacham Rabbi Yehuda, why are you crying? So he said to him, I don't understand. Well, you, look, you look in the Torah and you find some of the greatest of the, of the characters in, in Tanakh were praised as being the most great and lofty minds possible. You look at Doeg and Achitofel, these were rabbis who could spit 300 questions about any of the most abstract and irrelevant halachic query. They would have hundreds of different nuanced questions that they could ask. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. And, and they were so mind-bogglingly, you know, in, 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 to a degree beyond even comprehension, how intelligent they were. And yet, the Mishnah in Sanhedrin says that, that these people, Doe Gachitovel, are people who don't have a portion in the world to come. How is it possible 
that a person like you and me, Rav Yehuda and Shmuel, could ever arrive at those lofty heights of understanding could arrive at that ability to think about the example that the Gemara gives was a migdal haporeach ba'avir, right? A floating chest where you have a, you know, this chest. The question is, can it be kabbal tuma and so on and so forth? These incredibly lofty, abstract ideas, even the halachas that they're discussing are lofty halachas. They're floating in the air, way beyond grasp. And there's an amazing answer that Shmuel gives Rav Yehuda. Rav Yehuda turns to Shmuel and he says, Amar le shinuna, my dear sharp friend, Tina haisa They had dirt in their hearts. There was dirt. There was mud. There was there was krumkite, so to speak, that was that had penetrated to the core of who they were. The Torah was unable to reach their hearts. But in addition to that their hearts was unable to reach the Torah. In other words, the contact that would take place between the Torah and the person who's meant to be transformed by means of the Torah was unable to happen by means of, by, when it came to cases of Doeg and Achitofel. So that the distance between the Torah and the, and the human being remained unbreachable. There was, this, there was this impenetrable wall that stood in the place between the two. And to them, their relationship to Torah was entirely intellectual. It didn't speak to the nefesh behemto. It didn't talk to them about what they were supposed to be. Like they tell these stories, I don't know if any of this is true, but they, they tell these stories how before the Holocaust, you know, so in the, in the shadow of the Enlightenment, you would have, you know, these, you know, great Torah scholars and these top yeshivas in Europe who were incredible tamid chachamim and they were handling and Reb Chaim, Brisker, Lamdus and Svaras while they were sitting in the bathroom on Shabbos with a cigarette in their mouth, sitting there learning their Gemaras. You know, this was apparently, this was a matzah that was taking place uh, in Europe pre-war, you know, in, in, certain, in certain environments. And that, that whole idea, in other words, like the Gemara talks about, Alma Abda Aretz, why was the, with the base of Mikdash destroyed? Why was Eretz Yisrael sent into, into Galus? Shalom Berchu Torah Tchila. Because they wouldn't make the Birchus Torah before learning Torah. So most people gaze right over that. Oh, yeah, they weren't learning. They weren't davening. No, no, no. They were learning. They just weren't saying Birchas Torah before they sat down to Steig. So you think to yourself, like, how on earth is that possible? I don't get What are you doing? Like, you're sitting down to learn Torah. You're opening up your Gemara and you're ready to Steig. But, but you're not making the bracha? Like, what is this? Why would you sit down and learn Torah? So, you, you know, unless you kind of have that experience or you ever encounter somebody like this, and you realize that unless you make an effort to bring Torah into your foundation, to allow it to change who you are, it remains always at a distance. It remains an intellectual pursuit, something academic that you can be involved in, that you can dabble in, and, and it's you know, a really incredible thing, and it's really interesting. It's like you read these, you know, I, if you guys have this experience, if you read any academia, so you, have, you read these articles by people who are like, Mamish, they've read like dozens of Svarim, their Bikiyim and the writings of the Ramchal or of Cook, and you know, they've analyzed all of 15th century Ashkenazic Jewry. And meanwhile, they're like secular guys, like they're walking down the street, they're like, you know, they have no Kesher to Torah. It's, it's a mind boggling thing when you read it. It's Mamish, like, you can bring tears to your eyes when you see someone who could have so much involvement with Torah. And yet it says so little to them about the nature of life. And it's not being utilized to speak to their human condition in any way. And when it remains like that, it remains hopelessly beyond our reach. And there's no way for us to access it. And so one of the things that Yesoji Yesod is telling us is that the foundation upon which a tzaddik builds their life is, is the very aspect that within my physical human life, being a chibur of Shamayim and Aretz, being the, the combination of, of Adam and Neshama, in that combination, Gufa, is the place and the only place where a channel to Hashem's aura could come to light. And I must allow in the Torah to speak to every quality of who I am and bring it up to, up to the forefront. And so there's another Gemara about like this in Shabbos, but I think it's also brought out in this, this amazing idea, a beautiful medrash in the in Medrash Tehillim, where it says a beautiful thing. It says, the Pasuk says in Tehillim, Ner l'ragli devarecha. 
that the Torah, your word, Hashem's word, is a candle to my feet. So it's the Gemara, the better says a beautiful thing. It says, what are the Rishayim comparable like? So it's like somebody who's walking in the darkness of night, pitch black. So they come up to a stone, they step over it. They, you know, they stumble over it. They arrive at a pit, they fall into it. So derech Rishayim kafela lo yadu kashelu. It's the path of Rishayim is like darkness. They don't even know what they're falling into. They have no clue what they're about to stumble into. So it says, what are the tzaddikim like? Here's what a tzaddik is like. Lemisha mahalech va'avuka biyado. It's like a person who's walking with a torch in their hand. They come up to a rock, they protect themselves. The torch helps them protect themselves that they don't fall in. If they come up to a pit, they're prevented from falling in. So that's what David Amelech said to Akadosh Baruch, who says in Madrish. Said, I was about to be Michal Shabbos. Heira liyas Torah. The Torah enlightened it for me. What? David was going to be mechal. Sh- what does that even mean? David's going to be mechal Shabbos. What is this before he learned the Torah? Is this after he learned? When was he going to be mechal Shabbos? He was going to be mechal Shabbos. The Torah was a light for him. Shemar Shemar Siyom Shabbos. It says Shemar Siyom Shabbos. You got to you got to protect Shabbos. Basi leniuf. I came to to promiscuity. I was going to sleep with somebody. Heira liyas Torah. The Torah lit the way for me. Shenem are most yumas hanoef hanoafes. Whew! Saved, you know, uh, saved by the by the bullet, right? So that's what the pasuk means when it says ner l'ragli devarecha. What does this mean? What this means is that David Amelech and what the tzaddik does is that he encounters life head on with all of its complications, with all of its experiences, with all of its aspects that are rooted in physicality, and he recognizes that the only way to elevate this experience to successfully navigate what I'm involved in right now is to utilize the Torah as my torch, the ner l'ragli. It shows me how I can tread carefully through this experience, how I can be elevated by this experience, not subjugated upon by this experience, not allow myself to be to be imposed over by the experience of a Shabbos, of a Neof, of, of so on and so forth, but allow Torah to illuminate where my feet rest and that it's gufa where my feet are going to be treading, that is going to be illuminated and brought into that ur. And it's the role of a tzaddik to constantly allow himself that every single aspect of his life can become illuminated by the Torah, and that he builds his life as a foundation upon that Torah. So moving from, from this idea into the next meter, because I know the hour is late, but moving from here into Malchus should be Yisod, as we transition our way from the Yisod, which is the channel for Hashem's will to be manifest in the world, and Malchus, which is the very manifestation itself, and here's where things can get a little bit hazy, uh, you know, a gray area between the two Midos. What happens when a person steps in to the role of a tzaddik is that they are constantly aware of the fact that, that they are part of a, of a universal collaboration endeavor to bring light into the world in every single aspect of life. And when a tzaddik recognizes that, the way the Shlomo Melech puts it is that Migdal Oz Shem Hashem, that the name of God is a, is a powerful, a mighty tower. Bo Yarut Tzaddik V'Nisgav. A tzaddik can run in the name of Hashem and he'll always be protected. That when a tzaddik is Boteach in Hashem, and he's always running, representing that aura in the world. So then he has nothing to fear because he recognizes that he'll never stumble. He's constantly protected by the space that he, that he has created for himself. But more than that, the tzaddik recognizes that it's not just him, that he's part of a, of a leadership collaboration across my Sebracious, the goal of which is to, as, as we've been talking about throughout the Midev Yisod, is to justify creation, to allow the Yehi Or to come to fruition, to answer yes to the question of Nase Adam, to successfully choose life, and to ultimately partner with Hashem in being in being Shutvim and Maisa Bereshis. And we know that this is the role of the Tzadikim from the beginning. There are various Midrashim, many Midrashim that talk about this straight off the bat. They're one of the you know first Midrashim in the in the Bereshis Rabbah, talks about this idea how Hashem 
collaborated with the tzaddikim before creation even happened. Hashem wanted to know, should I create existence? Should I be involved? What do you guys say? What do you think? So as the, the, the Lashem of the Medrash is, Darshan in the Pasuk in Divrei Ayamim, Heima Hayotzrim, that Imamelech bin Lachto Yashvu, that they were sitting, these formers, the Yotzrim, which we are, we've already seen, the role of a tzaddik is to be involved in creation. That it, The Gemara said that Rava taught us that a tzaddik ultimately should be able to actually create. What we find here in the Medrash is that we actually were creating. The Lashem of the Medrash is, that along with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, the souls of the righteous were sitting along with him. It was with them that Hashem took counsel and created the world. And as the language of the Medrash Tanchuma says, It's not enough, Tzadikim, that you are Mamish, the deciding factor on the panel of the, the creation panel about whether we should create the world or not, but that it's all for you also. It's all made for you. It's all set for you. And so I think that the, one of the ideas which Malch, Malchot so sets out for us is that the Tzaddik recognizes that they're part of a, of a much larger picture. And that, they're, that when a Tzaddik successfully illuminates the world, illuminates his own life, illuminates the lives of those around him. It's the experience of that tzaddik that they are part of the of the vindication of light over darkness in my Sibiratius, to use a slightly metaphorical uh, comparison. And, and it's because of that that the tzaddik is, is representative of something so much more than just a human being who happens to have made it and been mashlim himself in the world. They're representative of the entire endeavor for creation. They, what they represent for us in this world is the synthesis between God's desire to be, the issues that arise, I mean the, the desire for creation to be, the issues that arise with the necessity of Bechira, of the opportunity for man to destroy the world, but also to create it, and is expressive of the entirety in doing that. And I think that's probably for, for that's one of the reasons why the Gemara in Chagiga says that when a person is choosing a Rav, the Rav should not just be a really great Tabachacha. We don't just draw the line at, is he really, really smart? So we already know from elsewhere in Shas that you have a kol tamul chacham she'ein bo das nevela tovah mena. That any tamul chacham who doesn't have the aspect of da'at, of connectivity, of the intimate connection with the knowledge that he has and the ability to, to bridge gaps between himself and others, the tamul chacham who doesn't have that, it's not even worth dealing with. But the Gemara in Chagiga also says, darshanim the Pasuk Malachi of kisif se kohen yishmiru das, that if a Rav is comparable to a Malach Hashem Tzvakos, then you can learn Torah from him. But if not, don't even bother. Don't waste your time. And probably one of the implications of this, of which there are surely many, is that the Tzadik, the Talmud Chacham, is not just somebody who's aggregated wisdom. They're a person who's representative of the entire leadership board of Maise Bereshis. They're part of the actual structure of how things get done in the world. The same way that a Malach is an agent of activity in the world by means of which Hashem's Ratzon comes to fruition in the physical world, that's what a Tzaddik is meant to be. This is, by the way, it probably became one of the you know, fundamental tenets of Hasidus, the whole idea that, a, that the Rav, the Rebbe, should be somebody who is actually expressive of the Kaddish Baruch Hu's will. Indeed, as the Gemara speaks about throughout Shas, that uh, there's this idea of a tzaddik goes there, but Kaddish Baruch Hu mekayim. That when Hashem, when a tzaddik rather, it makes a decree, so Hashem has no choice, so to speak, but to be mekayim that decree. And that there's no, there's no other option out. Because the, the whole point with that idea is that a tzaddik is expressive of the divine will. 
He's bringing that into the world. This is the Gemara in Moed Katan and Tezayinam base that the darshan in the pasuk of Moshel ba'adam tzaddik, uh, Moshel yirat Elohim. So it's the Gemara over there says that Rabbi Avo explains that Hashem says, <clears throat> "Do I rule over man? Ani Moshel ba'adam." Me, Moshel B, who actually rules over me, says Hashem? The Tzaddik. The Tzaddik is the one who rules over Hashem. Shani gozer gzera, because I, Hashem, make a decree, umivatla, and the Tzaddik can go ahead and actually nullify that decree. And we could leave the discussion of how exactly that works. If, if the Tzaddik is expressive of Hashem's will, then how could it be that Hashem had a gzera to the opposite? You know, before that, that's a discussion for another time. The point is that the tzaddik is actually the manifestation of Hashem's will in the world. He's much more than just a great person who's done justice with his life. And in addition to that, there's the element of the tzaddik which recognizes that the tzaddik is, in a sense, not unique in the role that he plays. Because there's always going to be somebody who is embodying Hashem's will in the world. Like the Gemara says about how there will always be the Lamed Vav Tzadikim in the world. That we always have a presence of Tzidkus, no matter what generation it's going to be. There always has to be that presence of Tzadik within the world. Because that's what it means to have a world. If we're here, and the world has successfully been created, then it's only been created because Yevayahi Or actually came to fruition. And it's also for that reason that the Gemara says, Numa that there's a constant presence of the of, a, of tzaddikim in the world. So I was th- I have the Gemara in Yuma over here, but I think there's a Gemara that's more specific. But the Gemara in Yuma over here on Lama Chesam Abay says, "In tzaddik niftar mina olam ashe nivra tzaddik kemosa." That a tzaddik never leaves the world unless there's already been another tzaddik created at his caliber to fill that place. Vezara Hashemesh uba Hashemesh. Right? So it's always Adshalokovsa Shimsho Shal Eli, Zarcha Shimsho Shal Shmuel. Before us before you know the, the light of the presence of Eli was diminished in the world, Shmuel's light began to shine. And this whole idea is that again, that the tzaddikim are part of this universal collaboration for light in the world. And that a tzaddik recognizes that they're part of something far beyond themselves. And that to whatever extent that they are a channel for that R, they recognize that this is one out of an infinite possible expressions of the R of my Sabratius. And that there's a continuity. And that because of that, there's a requirement for sharing that R. But there's also a requirement to be able to hand over the torch in the same way that Moshe had to successfully be Masra Leo Shua before he was able to go, like Chazal make the comparison of Moshe being the Shemesh and Yoshua being the Levana, the idea that tzaddikim are part of the collaboration requires that tzaddikim work together and collaborate their knowledge, unify their light, bring the entire world into the being mitaken olam b'malchut shakai and allowing that all of Bnei Basa would be yikru, be shmecha, to call out in the Kaddish Baruch Hu's name. And so one of the things that malchut shabi yisod leaves us with is the responsibility for a tzaddik to step in to the universal project of being mitake in the world, of rectifying each and every aspect of creation, that if even a tzaddik is involved in one thing, if they're mitake in one davar, if they do one mitzvah properly, they've rectified the entire world as a result of that. And Rav Kook writes this just very beautiful, we'll, we'll close with this, that uh, Rav Kook writes in the Shemona Kvatsim, he says the following language, very powerfully. He says, tzaddik tamid omed beina Elohim ubeina olam. The tzaddik is always standing directly juxtaposed between God and the world. Mikasher hu et ha'olam. He unifies and connects the entire world to the light and the speech of Hashem. Kol chushav shel tzaddik amitin netunim em le'akishor elohish olamot kulam. All of the movements of the sensations of the tzaddik are given to a connectivity between a divine connection amongst all the universes without any sort of limitation. He says, Kulam b'lo shum shiur him akordim shala musika kedosha. 
So they themselves are the chords of the holy music, that by means of them, the life of the divine, the, the light of the dreams of creation, give forth their voice in, in, in full expression, in a kol az. Um, and it's worth reading the entire piece over here. But the idea is that through that commitment and the faithfulness to bring out the life and the beauty and the light that is innate within all of creation, recognizing that they are part of this across the universe, they allow themselves to step into the light and be the greatest possible giloy of ore that they could ever do on their own. So these are some thoughts for Malchut Shabi Yisod and Yisod Shabi Yisod. And there's a, there's a lot of ideas over here. Definitely a lot more steps to go to figure this out all the way. But, uh, but thanks for collaborating with me on this, working together, trying to discover a little bit more about how we can find that or in Maizabaratius.